Hello all, I'm sure you all know by now that I have a second book coming up. It's a follow up to my first book and it is called The Origin of Names, Words and Everything in Between, Volume 2. If you've read the first book then you have a very good idea as to what this second book will be like. And like that first book, it is full of interesting fascinating etymologies and word origins. And like that first book, it is split into different categories, each full of easy to read and easy to understand sections. This second volume however contains completely new words and names, well not newly invented words but words not covered in the first book and it's 15 whole new categories this book covers. Now of the old categories in the first book I talked about countries and towns, now that stuff's covered it's completely new content, completely new categories. I can promise you that anyone who loves this channel or just names and words and etymology in general will adore this book and even someone you may know who enjoys words or sort of fun facts in general may enjoy this book as a gift too, it would make a really great gift. Well. I think so anyway, but I'm going to say that. This book is now available to pre-order and will be published on the 16th of November 2021. And the best way of pre-ordering this book is by going to Amazon and searching Word Origins Book into Amazon and clicking on the non-sponsored link. This helps Amazon's own search algorithm and allows other people to discover the book. However, also feel free to check out whatever books are available in your part of the world and pre-order your copy from there. However, you may still be unsure as to whether this book is even for you or not, and if that's the case, well, I hope this video changes your mind. That's because this very video is an animated extract from the upcoming book. The words you're about to hear me speak were words I wrote for the origin of names, words and everything between volume 2. This is a sneak peek of sorts. And this animated extract is from the website section of the book. We very rarely go a day these days without looking at one website or another. And some of these websites are so gosh darn ever present in our lives that we don't ever really stop and take a moment to think about their names because some of these names are really, really weird. And not only are the names of some of these websites really weird, the origin of these names can be pretty weird too. So please enjoy this extract from the book explaining how a selection of websites got their names. If you can think of it, Amazon will most likely sell it and ship it to your front door. You may very well have purchased this book from Amazon, or you may be reading it on a device owned by Amazon, or even listen to it through another website owned by Amazon. The selling of books was Amazon's starting point, and it was thanks to a certain book as to how the company got its name, that book being The Dictionary. Amazon went through a series of possible names before, most noticeably it was Kadabra.com, as in the things magicians say. This was ditched however as many thought it sounded too much like cadaver. In search for a new name, Amazon's founder Jeff Bezos searched through the pages of the dictionary to find an answer. He wanted a name starting with A so they would appear first or near the top of various directories. It was in the pages of the dictionary where he found the name Amazon and it just spoke to him. Before being the name of the world's biggest bookstore, it was the name of one of the world's biggest rivers. Bezos wanted to make a website that was unfathomably huge, so huge that the sheer size and magnitude of it would leave people in awe, much like the Amazon River does. It seems he got his way as Amazon.com is now pretty darn big. There were other ideas toyed with however. These include the likes of Awake, Browse, Bookmall and Relentless. Some of these names got further than others it would seem. If you visit Relentless.com to this day, you will actually still be directed to none other than Amazon. It should come as no surprise that I spend quite a lot of time on the internet. So how have I never visited the website of Baidu? It's ranked as the fourth most popular site on the entire internet, yet I have never heard anyone around me using it. Well, that's because this is very much a Chinese website. They're de facto search engine. So while it's more or less unused outside of the nation, China's massive population alone makes this one of the world's most popular sites. The name of this website has very similar etymologies to Google its worldwide counterpart. Google comes from the number of a Google, which is a one followed by 100 zeros. The search engine was named after this impossibly large number to represent the impossibly large number of results the search engine could provide. Bardu's name is similar to this as it literally translates to a hundred times or countless times, which too invokes this image of a staggeringly huge amount of answers. What's especially interesting about this name is that it wasn't just chosen to have a similar meaning to Google's name, as the term actually comes from a line from the classical Chinese poem Green Jade Table in the Lantern Festival by Xin Jin. The line reads, having searched hundreds of times in the crowd, suddenly turning back, he is there in the dimmest candlelight. 
This shows us the name Baidu not only plays on the same concept as Google's name, but it's also a nod to the wonderful poetry from Chinese history. It might seem odd to imagine now, but there was a time when the internet was a new thing. While we can all more or less navigate the web with ease, at the start, people needed a helping hand with understanding how basic web browsing worked. You have to imagine just how alien putting something to a search box and getting a result would have seemed in those early days. Luckily, a certain someone was able to lend a helping hand in those early days, that being Jeeves. Jeeves has been the quintessential butler name since the publication of the Jeeves and Worcester stories by P.G. Woodhouse in the early 20th century. Butlers are seen as helpful people who can assist in any way possible. They are very good metaphors for search engines, especially at a time when people didn't quite understand search engines. This is why the name Jeeves was used in the name of the search engine of Ask Jeeves. This name was accompanied by an image of Jeeves himself, looking exactly how you'd imagine a butler named Jeeves to look. The use of the name Jeeves easily made people realize that they could ask this search engine a question, the same way they could ask an actual butler the name Jeeves. Ask Jeeves played a really pivotal role in helping those early adopters of the internet understand exactly how the World Wide Web worked. As the years went on however and people got to grips with the internet, Jeeves wasn't needed anymore. He wasn't made redundant, he had simply done his job. In 2006, the site's name was changed to simply ask.com and a blog post was published explaining that Jeeves was retiring. While the name may not live on, his legacy certainly does. Incidentally, there's a chance that we really shouldn't have ever had asked Jeeves as a name in the first place, as the site's creator never actually got permission to use the name and likeness of Jeeves, the literary character, from the estate of P.G. Woodhouse. Do I have to ask permission to use a copyrighted character is maybe the first question they should have asked Jeeves. In these modern times, people aren't fussed about how many stars movies get. Instead, they want to hear that their film is certified fresh, or dread to hear that the film they've been waiting years to see is considered rotten. Most importantly, however, people hope that their films get a good score on the tomatometer. This new lexicon we use for film critique comes to us thanks to the movie review aggregation website of Rotten Tomatoes. This name might seem incredibly odd for a website all about the quality of films and performances, but tomatoes and the quality your performances actually have a rather long interlinked history together. Imagine if you will Shakespeare's Globe Theatre or any other suitable grand stage. On this stage is a performer of some kind, an actor, singer, dancer, whatever. Unfortunately however they aren't doing the best of jobs and the audience are starting to realise this. What happens next? Well, we all know the classic image of a performer being booed or stage for being terrible. This is usually followed by the hurling of rotten produce onto the stage too. The practice of throwing vegetables at things you don't like is an age-old tradition. We have evidence of the Roman Emperor Vespasian being so unpopular that he was pelted with turnips all the way back in the 1st century AD. As the years went on however, this act of throwing vegetables at things you don't approve of made its home in the theatres. Thanks to their shape, size, projectileness and their satisfying splat, Rotten Tomatoes became the go-to produce to hurl at bad actors. The first recorded instance of this actually dates back to 1883, in which an actor was pelted with rotten eggs and rotten tomatoes in New York City. Rotten tomatoes for centuries have been associated with how people perceive performances they watch. Instead of displaying their distaste for films with actual rotten tomatoes, tomatoes these days, audiences now go to the website of Rotten Tomatoes to show their displeasure in films. It's an incredibly fitting name despite how odd it seems at first. It wasn't just due to this fact however as to why the site has this name. The site's creator, Sena Zhuang, was a huge fan of the film Liolo which involves a boy who imagines his parent an Italian peasant and a giant tomato. The paternal tomato of this film helped inspire the name too. While not too many people have heard of this exact film, it played a huge role in cinematic history in helping name perhaps the most popular film based website on the internet. Despite its many flaws, it should come as no surprise that YouTube holds an incredibly special place in my heart. I wouldn't be writing this book if it were not for this website. YouTube now holds the title of the second most visited website in the world, just behind its search engine owner. The site's name however is pretty straightforward. The U in the name represents, well, you. 
This is because the website allows anyone to upload videos to the site. The tube part, however, comes from an old nickname for televisions, the tube. Televisions were called the tube because older TVs were made up of things known as cafe ray tubes. It's these tubes that brought shows and movies to so many people in the past as to why televisions are still known as the tube to some people to this day. While traditional television is undoubtedly still popular, YouTube has ushered in a new form of content for millions to watch and enjoy. In many ways though, it's like traditional television, except instead of actors and performers being on the tube, it's ordinary people like me and you making videos in their bedrooms and basements. It's a tube for you. So there we have it. That's how five websites got their names. And that's only half the websites covered in the websites category of the book. And that's only one category of the entire book. So if that video appealed to you, then remember that there are over 100 other word origins and etymologies waiting within the pages of this book. So once again, that's the origin of names, words, and everything in between, volume two, releasing on the 16th of November, 2021. Go pre-order your copy now by searching Word Origins Book on Amazon and clicking on the non-sponsored link or by checking whatever books are available in your part of the world. I really hope you enjoyed this video and enjoy the book coming out very, very soon. Thank you all so much. Take care.